we've got a series of alumni talks now, and a really warm welcome to everyone who's agreed to speak on this panel, and everyone's going to sit down here and speak. Um, and we've slightly changed the order, so we have three former students from the, who graduated in the 70s, uh, the 80s and the 90s, and then Rita Gardner from the Royal Geographical Society with the Institute of British Geographers will speak at the end of the session. Um, and we hope there will be time for questions and discussion and everyone else to share your experiences and your memories of being here too. So, our first speaker, and thank you very much for everyone who's agreed to talk, um, is Bill McQueen, who graduated with a BSc in Geography in 1973 and has had an illustrious career as a senior civil servant in the Scottish Government. And Bill is also former Deputy Chief Executive of the Crown Office and Procur Pro Procurator Fiscal Service, well done, well. sorry, <laughs> which should have practiced that, which is the single national prosecution service in Scotland. So Bill going to talk to us about mm -hmm. to study. No, it's fine if you sit down actually, that's okay. Right. Well done. Good afternoon everyone. <laughs> Can you hear? Can you hear? <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Measure. So, uh, I'm especially sad to hear of the death of June Shepherd because it was June that interviewed me in 1969 for a place here, which I came and then uh, subsequently graduated in 1972, not 73. Anyway, I had a career in the public service in Scotland. I can't claim that it was a planned career, but opportunities arose and unfolded, and I took them, and I found the career interesting and stimulating. In, in the year I graduated, there were 46 students, so classes were small and contact with teachers could be pretty close. Most of my peers typically went into uh, teaching, academia, planning, or other professions such as law and accountancy. I started a PhD here but didn't get very far, so I gave up after a year and went to work for the Social Science Research Council, now called the Economic and Social Science Research Council. I worked for the Geography and Planning Committees, which were chaired by a couple of giants, those of you of that generation will perhaps remember, Professor Reeford Watson and Professor Sir Robert Grieve. Anyway, that work made me want to do research rather than administer research scholarships and grants to universities. So I got a post as an assistant research officer in the UK government in Scotland. So as we heard this morning, it did a bit of assisting of research. And the start of that was work for something called the Local Government Boundary Commission for Scotland that was redrawing local authority boundaries and election boundaries. And obviously the skills of a geographer there in terms of analysing physical features, journey to work patterns, census data, locations of public and private service providers was relevant and, and useful to that work. <coughs> What I didn't know when I started out on a career in civil service, but you all know from watching Yes Minister, is that the real power and influence in government is with the mandarins, the senior civil servants, rather than with ministers, and it certainly wasn't with the researchers. So in this country, at least, there's a benefit that if you're a mandarin, you're not at the electoral whim of the voter, at least not yet, in the way that politicians are. So I looked for opportunities to um, get into that side of being a civil servant and I was successful at something called the fast stream competition for internal candidates. Now that was helpful but not absolutely essential because if you, if you have that label of a fast streamer you tend to get put into demanding jobs working with ministers and with senior officials. In Scotland there are 5,000 uh, civil servants in the core government departments, another 12,000 in devolved functions so it's a pretty big organisation with a budget of 30 billion a year uh, to work with. And one attraction of working in, in Scotland compared to um, Whitehall, say, is that the Scottish Department's mirroring most of what Whitehall does, allows a kind of wide canvas of, of jobs that you can occupy. Whereas if you're a civil servant in a, in a Whitehall department, you might typically spend all of your career in the Department for Transport or the Home Office or so on. <clears throat> so I did a variety of policy and management posts in quick succession and I started with one implementing the Conservative government's policy on council house sales and I was hopelessly ineffective in that job 
because I had to agree with each of 32 councils in Scotland an annual target figure for sales. <clears throat> and each of these councils would say, oh, our tenants are poor, we'll never achieve that figure that you're uh, mooting. But of course, in the end of the day, they all overachieved because the policy allowed them to keep and use any receipts above the figure which they agreed with me. And then to gain different experience, I moved to agriculture, uh, a job that administered farming subsidies um, to uh, livestock farmers, uh, European subsidies to beef sheep and pig farmers. So that was quite different and I remember a couple of things looking back there. One is the sense of humour of a department that for my first three days in the job sent me to a rendering plant, don't ask, an abattoir and a livestock market and you don't want to experience the smell of the first of those two at least. In fact I did once take a Scottish agriculture minister to an abattoir and that was another mistake. Within five minutes of getting into the building he said, Bill, get me out of this expletive deleted place and never bring me back again. Um, and, and the second memory I have was I was doing that job at the time that BSE became a, a, an issue um, and so the Ministry of Agriculture called a crisis meeting of lead officials from around the country as to how we were going to deal with it and we were all called to Whitehall but the lead official from Beef Division, what they call it in math, was late yeah, over an hour late and he came eventually I was terribly sorry I'm late I got summoned to see the Prime Minister this morning to uh, explain our options he said I can tell you there's certainly one mad cow over there and that was Mrs Thatcher <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, the most exciting job I did was, was after that which was privatisation of two Scottish electricity companies and my role was to recommend to the Secretary of State for Scotland the price at which the shares in the company would be sold and how we would do the allocations to customers of the company, com two companies, and to UK and overseas bidders for the shares. And we were advised by highly, highly paid uh, merchant bankers, stockbrokers, corporate lawyers, international lawyers. But in the, ev in the event, we rejected their advice on, on pricing the shares. They wanted to price them at a giveaway price. And there was actually a yes minister moment there because when we told them this, there was a moment of silence. And then they said, well, that's a very brave decision. And we then had a very nervous three weeks waiting to see what would happen in the stock market before the day of the flotation of, uh, of the shares. Fortunately, the stock market did not plummet, and so the float was a success, for taxpayers at least. And the only downside was that any of you who bought shares in Scottish Power or Hydroelectric didn't quite make as much profit as you would have done had we followed the advice of the merchant bankers. Uh, then did a stint as an efficiency reviewer in the Prime Minister's efficiency unit, and then progressed a bit up the greasy pole to senior civil service jobs and did th three different jobs there. Uh, the first one was advising the Permanent Secretary directly about restructuring the whole of Scottish Government to get it ready for uh, devolution and the advent of the Scottish Parliament. The second was a great job for a geographer because it was heading up the transport policy function in Scotland which covered rail, bus, aviation, ferries, ports, canals, cycling, um, road safety. And you typically found that every new transport minister wanted his or her own integrated transport strategy. So they would drag officials around the country talking to everyone, which was a great way of getting to know them and to get to know the country. But it had the downside that you met MPs, local councillors and even citizens, all of whom knew what was needed to be done to improve transport in Scotland and kept telling you this. Of course, none of them had the money to make a blind bit of difference to it. So the real work there was in taking legislation through the Westminster Parliament and subsequently the Scottish Parliament on um, finishing privatisation of the railways and deregulating the bus services. And, and we also in Scotland had tricky issues of negotiating how we would subsidise ferries with the European Commission. I think we also set up a challenge fund for big capital projects to get particular government funding to get started.
And then turning to the name that Alison struggled with uh, in introducing me, for the last six years of my career, I led a reform program at the wonderfully named Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, which is, as Alison said, the single prosecution service uh, for Scotland, which dates back to medieval times. 1,700 staff, including 600 prosecuting lawyers in 44 offices around the country. And the task there was really one of leadership and management to bring about reform in an organisation that was rather demoralised, defensive and inward looking. <clears throat> it had been criticised by two external judicial inquiries because it had failed to secure a prosecution of three young white youths for the murder of an Asian waiter with each of these three blaming one of the others and we failed to get a prosecution. So the task there was to reform the place, make it fit for the 21st century and in a way to start gearing up for terrorism. I was there while the attack on Glasgow Airport took place, cyber crime and historic sexual offences. So how did we do that? Well, we got a big increase in budget. We put lots of IT systems in so that the case processing could be done online and moved around the country to wherever we had capacity <laughs> to do it. We did a lot about um, supporting victims of crime and we did a lot about openness and publishing our performance. So I think we modernised most things there except the name. Uh, a lot of seemingly disparate and different roles there on that list, but I think there are some kind of common fundamentals in being a public servant. You have to understand government policy objectives, you've got to earn the confidence of ministers, and we have to be clear about the needs of, of users and what a successful outcome will look like. Uh, we had to work out what changes in either policy or legislation would be needed. And as I mentioned, you have to work out how to get and keep the funding that you need to deliver. And I guess, uh, looking back, you, you increasingly appreciate that in big bureaucracies, uh, success really requires a team effort and is often delivered through other people or agencies well at arm's length from you. So, coming back to the relevance of a geography degree, how did that help? I guess doing research and field work in different circumstances, different environments, is very useful. Um, trained to understand complex interdependencies, which is what happens a lot of government uh, social policy. Becoming competent or very good at data analysis, survey analysis. Having experience of project management and working in teams, being good at presenting results and conclusions to ministers on paper and orally, defending them against challenge, um, completing tasks, obviously important, and, and I think taking a holistic view, seeing the bigger picture was something that came through from geographical studies. Um, that is, is part of a, a giving you a platform from which to go forward. Um, I myself found working in the civil service and dealing with ministers, politicians and the media never dull and uh, rewarding intellectually, I'd say. Um, and you get some satisfaction from improving things which influence the lives of citizens. Uh, un undeniably, in the present climate, reductions in public spending and a focus on post-referendum negotiations with the European Union will make it even more challenging going forward to deliver effective public services. But I do hope that Queen Mary geography graduates will consider career options in the civil service. And if you do that, you will be talking a language that the Prime Minister, at least, can understand. Thank you. Well, well. Very much, Bill. That was really great. Um, and our next speaker in this session, this panel, is Professor Gillian Rose. And Gillian completed her PhD at Queen Mary and worked as a lecturer here from 1988 to 93 before moving to the University of Edinburgh. Um, Gillian's been at the Open University since 1999 and since 2004 as Professor of Cultural Geography. <clears throat> Thank you, Alison. Thank you for the invitation to come and uh, speak here. 
so, as Alison said, I arrived uh, at Queen Mary in Westfield, as it was then, uh, in 1985, with a uh, three-year studentship from the Economic and Social Research Council to write a PhD, so a three-year research degree. Um, and in the course of that, I was supervised by uh, Roger, Roger Lee, and also Philip Ogden, uh, and they both gave me two absolutely brilliant pieces of advice which have stayed with me for the rest of my career, which has been entirely in, in, in the academy, as Alison just outlined. Um, so, um, doing a PhD uh, at that point, in the, in the sort of mid-1980s, was a very different beast from doing it now. Uh, now, PhD students have to go through training in research methods, they have to give regular updates to the university authorities about how they're progressing, they have to go through a kind of evaluation process of the quality of their work after first year and so on. Uh, when I started, I remember um, occasional, incredibly interesting and very unstructured conversations with Roger uh, and Philip. Um, and I remember one in particular, um, the first one I, I, I want to say a little bit about that I learned from, which was about three months into my research. And I'd, I'd come to Queen Mary from Cambridge, where I did my first degree, very keen on theory and analysis. And I'd gone into the library and read philosophy and histories of cultural geography. And I'd carefully honed what I thought was this wonderful review. And I presented it to Roger, who um, discussed it with his usual you know, creativity and generosity. And I think at a certain point, I think I'm remembering this correctly, I might be making it up. He said, well, this is all very interesting, Gillian. I hope you said that, you might not have done. He said, um, I think at this point it would be good if you got out of the library and went and did some empirical field work. <laughs> so, um, which I did. Uh, although in my case, my thesis was actually historical, uh, so it involved moving from a library to an archive, so it wasn't quite such a radical move. Um, but all through my subsequent academic research, um, I think that balance between reading theory and thinking in more kind of abstract conceptual terms but also always going back into the field, the real world, don't particularly like that phrase, but uh, le learning from other places uh, has been a really important um, kind of balance in, in the kind of work that I've, I've, uh, uh, I've done. So thank you to Roger for the first piece of advice that's really uh, stayed with me as, as a very fruitful insight for my, my learning here. Uh, the second piece of brilliant advice I got, which has also uh, stuck with me, um, was from Philip uh, three years later, fast forward three years. Again, I bring what I think is this polished and very quietly proud piece of work to Philip. This time it's the draft, the first full draft of my PhD thesis. So this is three years of theory and empirical work. What I say is that I was so quietly proud of this. And again, wonderful discussion with Philip about the thesis was actually on local politics here in East London in the 1920s. Um, so uh, fascinating period, lo lots of things to, to discuss. Um, uh, and uh, at the end of that conversation, uh, Philip said to me again, I hope you said this is all very interesting, Gillian, but, um, and then he said, C can you summarize this thesis uh, to me in, in one sentence? And I thought, you know, three years, life, work, and he wants me to summarise it in a sentence. But actually, now that I am myself a rather battle-weary supervisor of PhD students, I think that, again, is an absolutely brilliant question to have been asked at that stage. And it's one that I always ask now my own PhD students at the appropriate moment. Can you summarise this to me in one sentence? So I think there's something there about... Um, you know, academics work in long, sustained periods of time, producing deep and robust kinds of knowledge, which I think are increasingly important and valuable at this particular moment, we might say. Um, but nonetheless, I think, no matter how, you know, it's three years, three months, three, but to be able to summarise something with clarity um, and, and to be able to communicate it uh, easily, I think is, is, a, is incredibly important for academics to be able to do, no matter how elaborate and sophisticated and insightful the underlying kind of apparatus is. So again, a fantastic piece of advice I got from my, uh, my time doing my, my PhD here. Um, I was then very uh, fortunate to be appointed to my first lectureship here at, uh, at Queen Mary as well, where I taught uh, human geography for five years. I was allowed to teach what were then kind of very emerging, uh, kind of cutting edge sorts of geography, feminist geography, for example. Uh, I was allowed to teach my own module in cultural geography, which was a new, a new field um, emerging. Um, I also remember going on field trips uh, in the uh, late 80s, which were rather different from the ones we're on now. Um, I remember three days with Ray Hall in Stoke. <laughs> uh, not Malaysia, and certainly nothing to do with scuba diving. <laughs> um, 
So, uh, I, clearly, field trips changed massively, but uh, I, actually, I do remember that field trip with Ray, who knew immense amounts about the sort of history and, and local contemporary geographies of, of, of the Stoke-on-Trent, Derbyshire area. It was incredibly enlightening and enjoyable um, through three or four days at that point. Um, I left Queen Mary in 1993. Uh, I've taught since at the Universities of Edinburgh, as well as the Open University, and, and next year I'm going to be moving to the University uh, of, of Oxford. And in that time, um, I think one of the other um, uh, excellent things about being a geographer, I mean, we heard some already, but I think it's the kind of um, capaciousness of the discipline to enable you to look at lots of different things uh, and, and bring a kind, certain kind of sensibility about the importance of spaces and places and landscapes uh, to them. So I've written on feminist geography, uh, I've explored family photography uh, as ways of making place and maintaining family networks across across uh, uh, dispersed families. Uh, I've written a textbook on visual research methods, which uh, has just gone into its fourth edition. Uh, I've looked at what people do in shopping centres. Uh, and increasingly, I'm uh, very interested in the ways in which digital technologies are changing our experiences of everyday urban spaces, uh, particularly how uh, visualising technologies uh, are making us see and experience cities in, in, in quite different ways. And I've, I've got a research grant starting in, in January looking at the impact of smart city technologies uh, in, uh, in Milton Keynes uh, in, 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 in particular. Um, I was awarded the Royal Geographical Society's Murchison Award in 2012, and in last year I was elected as a fellow of, of the British Academy. So uh, I have a um, certain kind of academic trajectory, um, but I think its roots were laid very, very firmly in those first few years at, at Queen Mary, and I'll always look back very, very fondly with my time, uh, my time here. So Ian graduated in environmental science at Queen Mary in 1995, uh, and went into a head of environmental science. Uh, Ian then joined the army, serving in the Royal Anglian Regiment as a major and in the Ministry of Defence, before becoming senior vice president at J.P. Morgan and his current role as senior manager in consulting at Deloitte UK. So Ian's going to say a few words. As you can see, I wasn't a very good student. I've just written some notes on a couple of pieces of paper. I think what Alison meant to say was I just graduated at Queen Mary, um, but we'll come to that a little bit later. So um, a couple of thank yous before we kick off. Firstly, to Dan, who's just in the front row, who's been a friend. We live together at the university um, for extending the invite, um, and also to Alison as well, just for giving the opportunity to, to speak to you today. And just listening to Jason and Will, I think Jason and Will over there. Um, they use the term privilege, and it, and it is a great privilege, A, to be here today. There's been some um, phenomenally erudite speeches so far. Um, and, and actually, I've, I've already, and we'll come to this as a common theme, I've already made some new friends actually today, which is it's a great news story. I should apologise, we saw earlier on the, um, the first set of briefs, there were some pictures of graduations. Uh, and I saw Dan and I uh, back in 1995 and I had an appalling tweed jacket on then. <laughs> and, uh, and I know I've done exactly the same today. So um, congratulations, Jason and Will. Much smarter the dress than I am today, um, and continue the good work in the, uh, the job set. Um, so I'm probably a bit of a wild card today. Um, I studied environmental science 1992 to 1995. I haven't done anything with that degree, frankly. Um, a source of great shame, as you can imagine. So, um, so I'll give you a quick whip around my career, if I may. Um, I kind of, I've got some insights just at the end, but actually I kind of wanted to pitch that to the younger generation in the audience. Um, I've probably just alienated 50-60% of the audience, and I didn't mean to. Um, just in terms of career advice and... Uh, apologies, is that, is that loud enough? Okay, sorry. Um, so I'll give a quick whiz around my career. I'm just going to pitch them some insights and some, um, maybe some advice to kind of the guys that are on the courses today just in terms of preparing for, for life post-university. Is that too loud? That's fine, sorry, okay. So look, my, uh, my career is a bit diverse. So when I was at university, um, I applied for and was awarded an army bursary. So effectively, in the course of each year, I used to get 1,500 pounds, three instalments, which I uh, used to refer to as beer tokens. Um, but that effectively signed me up for three years post-commissioning at Sandhurst uh, to serve with the army. So. Um, I went to Sandhurst straight after graduation um, and I spent, uh, I was only going to stay for three years, I was talking to Rita about it earlier. 
I actually stayed for 16 years, and I stayed for 16 years because I had such an amazing time. And it was always my intent to leave quite early, uh, and as a product of that, I think they kept giving me great jobs. Um, we touched on, I left then in 2011, went to JP Morgan, um, and I'll talk a bit about that in a second, and then I've only actually been at Deloitte for about five or six months, so it's kind of my third career change. Just in terms of the Army then, so I was uh, an infantry soldier, um, so I commissioned into the Royal Anglian Regiment, um, first serving as a platoon commander, and I guess the first part of my career was really in Northern Ireland uh, and internal uh, counter-terrorism, so my first tour was in West Belfast pre-Peace Accord, which makes me reasonably old now, um, so 1996 to 97. Um, the Peace Accord actually was two weeks after we left that operational tour. Uh, and kind of normal platoon command appointment, so managing uh, about 30 soldiers in an infantry company, and then infantry training school, and then mortars, which is kind of an artillery system for the infantry. Um, and then I kind of got streamed into staff jobs. So Bill talked a little bit earlier about working in central government. I worked at the Ministry of Defence as a staff officer, so um, I was kind of the bag man. Uh, for a, a lovely air marshal who's the Queen's representative in the Ministry of Defence, which was phenomenally informative for me uh, at that young stage in my career. Uh, I then went to Staff College, came back to the Ministry of Defence, I wrote Defence Policy uh, for Director of Reserve Forces for two years. Um, back to the Field Army and then really I hit that Middle East period, so I served in Iraq for a few tours, um, which were very, very interesting periods, and then back into the Ministry of Defence actually. So my final Field Command was Seven Armour Brigade, uh, again in Iraq, so I was actually fortunate to be on my own with an infantry battalion of the Iraqi Army in, in a place called Alkurna, which for those um, interested, it's on the confluence. Is that the correct term? Confluence? Okay, good. I remembered something. The confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates, so it's actually the location of the Fable Garden of Eden, so culturally very significant. It's about 12 kilometers actually from the Iran border. It's the only town that was captured by the Iranians in the Iran-Iraq war, um, and a heavy, heavy Shia population in that town. So a very interesting place to be militarily and politically as well for a period of time. <coughs> so really, post the Seven Armour Brigade, I went back to the Ministry of Defence. I then wrote strategy in the Deputy, Deputy Chief of Defence Staff's office um, for a year, and then I decided I wanted to transition from the military. A few reasons for that. I'd been a company commander, so I'd commanded 120 soldiers in operations, which is all I ever wanted to do. I was at my 16-year point, which is kind of pension, um, pension time in the military. I'd also been married for about 12 years and had three children. Uh, and honestly, I hadn't seen much of my children, so um, it was really a good time for me to go. And I, and I kind of want to come onto one of those themes about that transition in a second when we talk about insights. Um, so I left, uh, I was taken on to JP Morgan's um, uh, kind of veterans program which was embryonic in 2011 um, but in preparation for that I had actually whilst I was in the army working in the Ministry of Defence and some ops I'd actually read a, an MBA as well with the Open University um, which took me a couple of years probably longer than it should have done so it took me about five years I think in the end um, and that really prepared me just to understand the language people used in business so um, into JP Morgan I ran uh, for Europe, Middle East and Africa client onboarding for equities, um, so kind of institutional clients coming in uh, and making sure they're on the trading platforms and can trade in the markets of their choice. I've done that for about five years, so I ran the, the Europe group, I ran the Americas group, and then finally I ran the APAC group as well. So hugely interesting, very, very tough environment to work in, as you can imagine, American Investment Bank. Um, and, and then I decided to, to step change out into consulting. Um, so I've only been there five, five months. Um, I work in capital markets, which is really working alongside investment banks, understanding how they function, investment strategies, looking at operational efficiencies, looking at their structures, kind of technology and how that all, all comes together. Um, so that's kind, that's kind of the career uh, and I'm at Deloitte today. Um, I kind of, one of the things I just wanted to touch on was favourite memories. So um, Dan and I were laughing as we went around the geography department earlier. I remember sitting in a lecture with um, the lovely John Allen um, about energy efficiency and renewable energy. And as we finished, we all walked out the door together and he got in his 4.2 litre red Jaguar <laughs> and then kind of drove off with a big wave out the window. Um, which kind of made me laugh. And, and, and again, we've seen some amazing people today. So Geraldine we've seen, um, we've seen Laurie Wright, who happens to live in the same town as me today, I haven't seen for a long time. 
the lovely Jen as well, who works in the geography department office, who we joked earlier probably saved me £2,000 in photocopying. She let me use her photocopier so I didn't have to pay in the library. Um, Dan never knew that actually, otherwise I would have photocopied his stuff for him as well. Um, so just in terms, of, in terms of insights really, what do I think that, that degree gave me, or more roundly that time at university? I think um, Bill touched on this, the ability to analyse uh, and actually present cogently. Um, and if you're working with someone like the Ministry of Defence, even in an investment bank, people kind of want crisp analysis and they want it to tie back. They don't necessarily want to understand the detail, they just need to trust the outcome has got the detail sitting behind it and is presentationally what they can, what they can consume quickly. So I had a boss in JP Morgan, if I wrote more than one line on an email, wouldn't read it. Um, and my routine responses back from that individual were just one word. It was a yes or a no and that was it. So kind of the analysis part. I think the other thing university actually taught me was a few other things. The ability to manage time. I was probably a very poor time manager when I arrived. I think I'm probably not brilliant at it today, but it certainly helped me on that journey. Um, I actually learned to apply myself. Um, I'm so easily distracted, I can't begin to tell you. Um, so actually physically sitting down and having to study and, and write um, was, a, was a bit of an art that I think I took away from here. The other, the other thing that I've learned from being in the military uh, and actually being in business is this place really taught me to understand and cherish diversity. Um, so I come from a North East London overspill town, which is pretty one dimensional. Um, and actually coming here, you kind of mix with that diversity, and we touched on it again earlier. Um, so I really cherish that, and it's something that we do very well. Uh, whether it's the British Army, JP Morgan is huge on diversity, and Deloitte also. So it's something to be cherished that I learned about here. Final thing to mention actually is, is friendships. So uh, for, for those that are coming through university now, the, I mean, don't, don't underestimate the value of, of kind of connecting with people and you've got the, the technology today to continue those connections going in the future. And the transition that I made from the military to JP Morgan, and from JP Morgan um, to Deloitte, was based on friendships that I've made. So that kind of friendship that starts here, it might start at school, keep those networks going um, as you move through your lives. Just a couple of pieces of advice and then I'm gonna stop. Um, I was just writing this earlier, uh, and again, apologies, I don't even have a notepad um, or a pen. <laughs> Um, please, 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 um, for, for the undergrads today, enjoy yourself and, and your time at QMW. Um, and people used to say that to me, and I didn't really understand what they meant. Uh, and what it means is in, when you get into the big wide world and you start working, your time often isn't yours anymore. Um, so make the most of it while you've got it here. Um, and, and some other advice when you're transitioning into kind of regular roles or, or jobs is really do as much research as you possibly can, which sounds deeply obvious. But if you end up in a role that you're not enjoying, you're not going to enjoy going into work and peeling yourself off the sheet in the morning. Forget the drive for avarice and being paid a lot of money. If you don't enjoy it, you just won't survive in that environment. So really, really research. And again, it goes back to networking. If you've got networks at home, at school, uh, you've got them at university, really exploit those networks, uh, particularly online, to give you some good advice before you, uh, before you launch. And the, 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 I think the fundamental change from when I was here probably is I spent six or eight weeks um, in the university summer holidays going on holiday um, and lounging around at home, probably being a pain to my parents. I think nowadays that dynamic's changed and, and the assumption should be if you want to go and work in a big business, so a JP Morgan, I guess, or a Deloitte, the expectation is you're going to pick up the summer internship and actually physically go and live in that organisation for six or eight weeks in your summer holidays which uh, I feel deeply sorry for you for, um, but that's the only way you really get a term of reference in those organisations. Um, so I've probably spoken for too long, Alison. Um, you're nodding. Um, I really appreciate everybody's time today. And it's, 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 it's Susie. I've got one final thank you to Susie. So I've met a few people today. So Dan and I were outside the job the bottom. You're gonna have to forgive me now. And, uh, and Susie said, I really like my picture taken with a handsome young man and then gave the camera to Dan and had a picture taken with me. So thank you very much. <laughs> Bravo. That's great. Thank you so much, Ian. That was brilliant. And our final speaker, I'm really delighted to welcome Dr. Rita Gardner. Um, Rita was reader, 
and Head of Environmental Science at Queen Mary from 1994 to 1996, and since then has been the director of the Royal Geographical Society with the Institute of British Geographers. Uh, and just to just say a couple of things very briefly, that we have really strong links with the RGS IBG at Queen Mary in all sorts of different ways. We take all of our first year students to the RGS in their first term. Um, so this year, that was about 160 students, and I think they went in several different groups, but we take them all to the RGS, uh, and we think that's incredibly important as they're starting their geography degrees. Um, I'm taking a group of master's students to the RGS next week, uh, which we're all looking forward to, which would be great. And also, I supervise, um, I jointly supervise a PhD student, Chandan Mahal, who's a collaborative PhD, PhD student with the RGS, funded by the AHRC, working on family history, place, and diaspora, so as, as well as many, many other links that we have. But we can, thank you. Alison, thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here. It's a real pleasure to be back, actually. As soon as you walk onto this campus, I at least feel a real sense of warmth and a sense of belonging. And I was only here two years, so imagine what somebody like Philip, who spent his whole life here, um, actually feels when he walks uh, onto the, uh, 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 into the building. Um, I hope you feel the same. Do you feel the same? Coming back, that sense of warmth and belonging. Yes, I'm getting a few nods. Good, well, I'll take that as a yes, that's fine. Um, as, as, as I said, I spent two years here between 1994 and 1996 um, in the Department of Geography, which was a wonderful collegiate department, and it retains that collegiality um, to today. The geography departments uh, across the country vary in their character, um, and QM was always renowned as being one of those that was both very friendly um, and had a great um, excellence in teaching as well as in research and it continues those traditions today. So it's great to be an alumni of, of the organisation. It's lovely to come back and meet people I haven't seen for a long time. Jen uh, is one of them who was there. She didn't pay for my photocopying, uh, but she fished me out of trouble quite a few times in one way or another. Um, there's Ray, I can see at the back, I think, um, and, and, and others. So, for me, um, the, this is the, Queen Mary gave me this wonderful opportunity to grow myself as a geography academic then, with new responsibilities in terms of coordinating environmental science. But it also gave me a springboard. I had no intention of leaving Queen Mary College um, to go to the Royal Geographical Society, but when the opportunity to do that popped up, um, and I was lucky enough to get that job. Um, I moved sideways, as, as, as Ian said, I moved sideways to run um, the Royal Geographical Society. At that point in time, um, some people felt that the Royal Geographical Society was a little old fashioned. Um, I remember the Deputy Director of the Heritage Lottery Fund um, walking me around the garden of the Royal Geographical Society when we were applying for a £5 million grant. Um, to open the organisation to the public for the first time. And um, he turned to me, he said, Rita, he said, are you serious that uh, you really think that this male, clubby, closed organisation is going to change? And the response was, that's why we want the money. So the Royal Geographical Society, for those of you, and I've been asked to say some few words about the society rather more than about myself. Um, the RGS is the geography community um, in the nation. It's the learning society, it's the professional body, um, and it's a very, very, these days, a very, very vibrant organisation. Our work reaches about three million people, and we, our primary purpose, as we see it, is to safeguard and champion and develop, help develop, the geography discipline. Um, why is that important? Well, it's important for the reasons that my three previous speakers, not least, have enunciated. Geographers have an amazing set of skills and knowledge, um, and until fairly recently, they weren't always that well appreciated in the workplace. Um, and we also had that double whammy, if you like, of the tag of, well, you've just studied geography. Um, and that's absolutely not true. It's an amazing degree where you learn a huge amount 
Um, and you come away with it with a very particular set of combination of skills. Research skills, problem solving skills, analytical skills, skills to summarise, IT skills, people skills. You can work in teams. And most geographers and, uh, dare I say, in environmental scientists are also people, people. So what a great package that you can actually take into the workplace. But until recently, perhaps that was undervalued, and certainly some of us, when we studied our geography, um, felt that actually the scientists were a bit more important, or the mathematicians knew a bit more, or whatever it was. So what we've done in the RGS is we've modernised. We've modernised an institution that has a fantastic history. A history of sending um, Shackleton um, and Scott to Antarctica, a history of um, uh, being, and the organisation that sponsored and supported a huge amount of scientific, it was always scientific, expeditions and exploration historically. And we've changed and emerged from that um, in a number of different ways. So what does the organisation do today? As I said, we champion geography first and foremost. That means that um, we represent geography in a whole variety of fora. So prime amongst those is with government. Um, we are right at the heart, have been right at the heart of the replanning of the geography school curriculum over the last five or six years. We've seen a dramatic increase, um, partly as a result of changing government policy in the numbers of young people studying geography. It's gone up by about 30% in the last three or four years at GCSE. We've had an increase at A level. We've had a 10% rise in geographers going into university in the last two or three years. We've had six new geography departments and programs set up in recent years in universities that never used to teach it. So the subject is in, and I hope you're proud of this, because I'm really proud of it, our subject is in the best place it's been in for the last 20 or so years. Some of that's down to the society's work and activities on the policy front and in other areas, but much of it is down to everybody in the community playing their role. So whether it's people saying, I'm a geographer, which really matters, whether it's um, people pursuing research that can be used by government in its policy making, whatever realm it is, we are all in a sense a community that's responsible for our discipline and the way it comes across, and we've all been championing it in our own different ways. So the RGS, in a sense, helps to bring that together and provide a focal point for us to have a vibrant discipline. We work with all the universities that teach geography in the country. We work with half the secondary schools. Um, we started a programme in 2001 um, because of the demise of geography, increasing its secondary school, um, that has seen uh, a significant commitment of about £8 million going in to support geography teaching at secondary level. Um, it's the lifeblood, actually, of our discipline, and that's why we're now working with about half of the schools um, in, in England. Um, our resources in schools are, are used every year by about 1.4 million people, which is um, quite phenomenal some 15 years on from when we started our work um, with geography. So we fund and support and work with and collaborate with the research community to advance the discipline. You probably remember in your library days reading the transactions of the Institute of British Geographers area, the geographical journal, no, yes, I can see some nodding heads, we still publish them, they are published, we've added two more onto that, uh, an international climate change journal which we publish with the Royal Meteorologi Meteorological Society and the new open access journal. Um, so there's the work we do with, to, with the research community to support and promote geographical research, there's our work I've spoken about with schools. There's the work with government and policy, bringing geographical knowledge to bear where we can in terms of policy makers, but also being the ones who will go and bang on the doors, whether that's bang on the doors in, in Biz or Bays as it's now known, bang on the doors in the Department for Education, wherever, to make our case for geography. So I remember sitting opposite Nick Gibb, um, the schools minister, in his last reincarnation of the schools minister, not the current one, um, and for him to discuss, to discuss with him the English Baccalaureate. Now the English Baccalaureate is that 
cluster of, of GCSEs that young people can do that enables them to have a title of having the English Baccalaureate. That's two sciences, maths, um, two sciences, maths, English, uh, modern foreign language, and either history or geography. And I remember sitting opposite Nick Gibb and him saying to me, well, yes, history, of course history is in the English Baccalaureate. Geography? Geography? That was his, that was his sign language, geography. So it was up to us as a community then to convince Mr. Gibb that geography should be in the English Baccalaureate. Otherwise, it would just have drifted away out of the school curriculum to a much lower level than it is today. And between us all, across the community, we actually did that. So aside from those communities of research, education and policy, the Society also works, um, continues to work in expeditions and field work. We fund about um, 50 research projects a year and, and undergraduate expeditions every year. We provide advice and guidance. And we work with the public. Why do we work with the public? Because public parents. It's really important that the public get geography because we want them to encourage their next generation, their children, their grandchildren, to go and study what has to be the very best of disciplines uh, in the training it gives, in the knowledge it gives, in the outlook it gives us all, in how we view the world, how we interact with the world, and to some degree in how we lead our lives and shape our lives. Once you're a geographer, you have a view on the world, of the world, that is different. And you think of yourself, I think, in that context, differently. So I think I probably have my 10 minutes. I wanted to end by echoing what Alison has said about the close relationship between QM um, and the society. Uh, it's ones that we really enjoy. We rely uh, for a lot of our work. We have 58 staff and we rely on 2,800 volunteers who work with us. We raise all our own money every year. Like all the other learning societies, we get no government support, so we raise five and a half million pounds a year. Um, but QM has done so much more than many other departments, and our current vice president for research, of course, um, is at QM uh, too. So thank you for your time. If you want to be part of the geography community in London, there's bucket loads going on, 200 lectures a year. Um, a lot of other activities. You're very welcome to join the Society, but I'm not here to sell you membership or to encourage you to join. If you'd like to join, there's more information. Join as a fellow, you can have a geography degree, or you can join as a member if you would prefer. Thank you very much indeed. Oh, I should ask one question. Do we have any members here? Yeah. Special thank you to those of you who do support us. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well. well, thank you so much, Rita, and thank you very much to all four speakers. It's been absolutely fascinating. We have got a bit of time, and uh, just a, a short amount of time before tea. If anyone has any questions or anything else anyone would like to share about your time at Queen Mary and what you've done since. And I'm really glad to see just looking, the memory board is, is starting to fill up, which is great. So again, if you've got time and would like to fill out those cards over tea, please do uh, write some of your, your memories down and, and put them up on that board. Any, any comments, any questions before we break for a cup of tea? The last speaker, oh, I beg your pardon, the gentleman over there was stating that when you discuss doing something, Unless you're going to do it because you care or you're interested in what you're doing, don't do it. Do something else. And it's exactly what you said. Exactly what you said. So you, all, all four of you have actually said the same thing. And it's most interesting to listen to. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Any other to share. Right, but just to say, so there is some information, more information about the School of Geography, but also about the RGS on the table over there. Um, and there is tea, so please do go and help yourself. And it's a cream tea, so there are scones and cream and jam as well. So please 
help yourselves and enjoy looking at our displays again and please come and talk to our speakers and again talk to lots of other people and thank you very much. And those of you who are coming to the David M. Smith lecture, we will be leaving from here um, at about 6.15, so there's plenty of time for tea and to chat and to meet people. Thank you and thank you again to all of our speakers.